UFOs and UAPs are not alien in origin, but secret man-made craft. A 2021 poll indicated that 11% of the American population say that UFOs reported by people in the military are definitely evidence of intelligent life outside Earth, and 40% say this is probably evidence, meaning 51% of people in the US are fairly convinced that UFOs are alien in origin. Occam's razor is a theory that simply states, usually the simplest explanation is the correct one. In this case, ionization and world sighting locations point to a man-made source for UAPs and UFOs. In March 2024, the Pentagon released a 63-page report regarding all the evidence that they had going back to the 1940s regarding UFOs, concluding that there was no evidence that UFOs were extraterrestrial. The term UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object. Scientists have recently replaced this with the new term UAP, which stands for Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon. If they are not extraterrestrial and are not misidentified, there is only one other option. Guy Kramer was contacted by NASA, JPL, which is their Jet Propulsion Laboratory, in the early 2000s to help them with a classified program concerning air ions, stating, When they contacted me, I was surprised and asked them why they were not speaking with their own NASA scientists. Their response was that I was considered the expert in the field, and they did not fully understand this area, which encompasses several scientific disciplines. At the time, Guy had been working with Senator John Warner's office when he was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee on several programs that required Guy's background in this field. One of his papers regarding a highly critical and large potential weakness to U.S. homeland security, which had been unknown prior to this, was submitted to the White House for review by Warner's chief of staff. Guy's theory, which is still undisclosed, was verified by the White House to be a very substantial, clear and present danger, and mitigation efforts he proposed in the paper were then provided to the Department of Defense for testing. Guy had been a research assistant to his grandfather, Donald Hings, from 1996 to 2001, where they routinely tracked aircraft up to and over the horizon, utilizing proprietary instrumentation, which passively tracked these aircraft from the air ion wave propagation that travels at about one-third the speed of light from the aircraft, even tracking the Space Shuttle Discovery entire re-entry and landing from thousands of miles away. Hings was the inventor of the walkie-talkie in 1937 and had 56 patents to his name. Hings was the leading expert in this field, and with his passing in 2004, Kramer became the de facto expert. Guy continued, NASA JPL was unable to disclose much about the program, but I helped them with what they were looking for. They told me that my information, which only took a few weeks for me to compile, had saved them between 10 to 15 years of research they would have had to do themselves. With Guy's unique understanding and perspective, he has been able to show that the characteristics of UFOs or UAPs utilize air ionization for propulsion, and this is not beyond human technical ability. Guy points out that our first clue that these are man-made is the clustering of sightings that seem to occur in specific allied countries, especially the United States. These craft seem to avoid flying across the U.S.-Mexico border. Most UFO UAP reports came out after World War II, and this video shows when and where many of the reports came from. It is very interesting that if these were aliens, they tend to be amalgamated over the US and the United Kingdom early on, then into Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. These five countries are also known as the Five Eyes, which is an intelligence alliance formed during World War II between the UK and USA and expanded in 1948 to include Canada and 1956 to include both Australia 
and New Zealand, and the sightings in those countries begins to grow after their inclusion. If these were in fact aliens, there are few reasons why you would avoid China, Russia, Mexico, Africa, or any other large landmass. Another big clue that these craft likely originate from the U.S. are the large abundance of sightings in Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory, but very few in neighboring countries of the Dominican Republic or Haiti, which are not U.S. territories. Similarly, the Hawaiian Islands also have a disproportionate number of sightings when compared to other islands of comparable size and population. Madagascar off the coast of East Africa, with a population of 28 million, has virtually zero sightings. Why do so many people believe this technology is alien? When we look at many of the UFOs or UAP's characteristics, we see a trend among many of them. Flight characteristics such as acceleration, speed, and maneuverability beyond known aircraft. No apparent engine or form of propulsion. Strange shapes often saucer-shaped, cigar-shaped, or rounded. The continuous light source associated are often round, and the craft may be another shape, such as a triangle, but with three circular lights near each corner. The main glow is usually limited to the underside of the craft. Little to no noise associated with the craft, closer observations report a humming noise. When flying, the lower hull will glow as a colored light or lights that often change color. The smell of ozone in the local vicinity, lack of a sonic boom at speeds above Mach 1. Guy points out that all of these items can be attributed to either ion propulsion and or electrostatic repulsion. If you ionize particular shapes, you can counter ions in the air to create lift and thrust. In 2018, it was demonstrated that spiders can fly hundreds of miles utilizing electrostatic repulsion. Their silk is negatively charged and this repels the negative charge from our planet's surface. The shiny metallic skin in many sightings is likely an early requirement as this metal would need to be ionized. Painting it any color would reduce this ability. More modern reports indicate some of these newer craft are black and the ionization propulsion system is now limited to circles on the underside of the craft, allowing for different shapes and potentially larger vessels, but harder to observe the overall shape at night due to the black paint. And this paint may also be radar absorbent as seen on the F-117 stealth fighter and B-2 stealth bomber there is a huge electrical potential in the atmosphere. An electric field of 200 volts per meter would mean there would be a 400 volt difference between the ground and a 0.2 meters above the ground. That's about a 400 volt difference between our head and our toes when we step outside. Could we simply repel that negative ground charge with negative ions using electrostatic repulsion to levitate a round disk? not very efficiently, it would require an enormous amount of energy and would unlikely be able to simulate some of the unique flight characteristics found in UFOs or UAPs. Kramer states, There is something different going on here. In 1990, I took a trip with my father to Australia, New Zealand and Fiji, where I conducted special experiments with a very sensitive ion detector developed by my grandfather. One particular experiment on that trip resulted in a substantial discovery. I discovered what causes wind. Kramer continues, In 1991, my grandfather and I were visited at his laboratory by three professors, the head of geophysics for Simon Fraser University, SFU, the head of geophysics for the University of British Columbia, UBC, and a professor of engineering and instrumentation for UBC. The professors looked at the instrument and the data I had obtained from that trip, and one of the professors exclaimed, Do you know what you discovered? To which I replied, Yes. He responded with, I don't think you do. 
you discovered what causes wind? And I responded with, I know that, he said to me. You don't seem too excited about it? I said, that was just one of many discoveries we have made with these instruments. He looked surprised and said, your discovery would be considered a pinnacle achievement for many in my field. I dismissed his view, as I still believe to this day that many of our other discoveries were much more important than this. I will not go into details on what I actually discovered, but it is key to how you could utilize a system to counter it and exploit it to propel a flying craft that would have the traits we see in UFOs or UAPs, which means someone probably made a similar discovery many years earlier and the U.S. allied governments have exploited this exotic propulsion system for decades in secret. The system would require round disks or a round hull to be powered in a specific manner to exploit this natural yet unseen and difficult to detect geophysics mechanism. A byproduct of this propulsion system creates ionization, which is the electric glowing hull or separate disks. And this is not beyond our knowledge and means to manufacture these craft. Scientists unfamiliar with this particular geophysics system, meaning almost all scientists, including physicists and geophysicists, may see one of these craft in flight and conclude that it was well beyond our engineering capability. It is not. It was probably discovered by people in the late 1930s or 1940s. They haven't reverse-engineered alien craft from other worlds. They simply discovered this enigma, likely around World War II, and found a way to develop a propulsion system that utilizes it. Canada's most famous UFO sighting, Falcon Lake 1967. The Falcon Lake event in Manitoba, Canada in May 1967, was investigated by the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCAF, Royal Canadian Air Force, and even the U.S. government came up to investigate. Stefan Michalak, an amateur geologist, was prospecting for quartz and silver in the woods of Falcon Lake, 150 kilometers east of Winnipeg, when he came upon two strange craft hovering with a reddish glow. He assumed these were experimental military aircraft. One descended and landed, and the other flew away. Stefan spent the next 30 minutes sketching it. After sketching it, he approached the craft, later recalling the warm air and smell of sulphur as he got closer, as well as a whirring sound of motors and a hissing of air, and could hear voices inside through an opening, thinking they might need help. He called out, and when the voices stopped, he called out in different languages. He was close enough to look inside, but did not see anyone, just a lot of coloured lights. The hatch closed, and he touched the hull with his glove, which melted the fingertips of his glove. The craft then began to turn counterclockwise, and Stefan says he noticed a panel that contained a grid of holes. Shortly afterward, he was struck in the chest by a blast of air or gas that pushed him backward and set his shirt and cap ablaze. He ripped away the burning garments as the craft lifted off and flew away. Disoriented and nauseous, Stefan stumbled through the forest and vomited. He eventually made his way back to his motel room in Falcon Lake, then caught a bus back to Winnipeg. He was treated at a hospital for burns to his chest and stomach that later turned into raised sores on a grid-like pattern, and for weeks afterwards he suffered from diarrhea, headaches, blackouts, and weight loss. Items were later retrieved from the encounter site, including Stefan's glove and shirt, and some tools which were subjected to extensive analysis at an RCMP crime lab. No one could determine what caused the burns. At the landing site was a circle about 15 feet in diameter, devoid of the moss and vegetation growing in other areas of the same rock outcropping. Soil samples, along with samples of clothing, were tested and deemed to be highly radioactive.
so were pieces of metal that were chipped out of cracks in the rock about a year after the incident. The metal had somehow been melted into the cracks. The U.S. and Canadian authorities' official conclusion was that this case was unexplained. Stefan held fast to the belief that these were not alien craft, but experimental military aircraft. The case is so famous due to the large amount of evidence from the sketch to the landing site to the physical burns which remained as scars on his chest for the rest of his life and the high amount of radioactivity found on the soil samples, clothing and tools found at the landing site. To this day, typical moss and plants do not grow where the landing reportedly took place. Kramer summarizes his take on what happened. To me, this event highlights a mission gone wrong. These government-developed and human-piloted craft did not know Stefan was there. They were far away from any expected people, and once they realized he was there and was looking in the hatch, took evasive action to have him move away so they could leave the area without further interaction. The sketch and description of flight characteristics glowing red light when hovering, sounds, smells and other parts of his description fit the bill of what I would suspect this technology to be available to the government in 1967. There is evidence that these exotic craft are capable of hypersonic speeds, faster than five times the speed of sound, and may be why the US trails both Russia and China in development of hypersonic missiles. Why invest in developing hypersonic missiles when you already have craft that can fly and maneuver at those speeds? To retain your secrecy, you would eventually make an effort to catch up with conventional hypersonic propulsion systems as we have recently seen. It may be unsettling to think that we are in fact alone in the galaxy. It has only recently been discovered that all complex life on Earth share the same eukaryotic cells, and the original event only ever happened once. The critical event appears to have occurred about two billion years ago when one simple cell somehow ended up inside another. Eukaryotic cells aggregate and cooperate to make everything from seaweed to sequoias, aardvarks to zebras, all complex multicellular life forms, that is to say, Pretty much every living thing you can see around you, and more besides, are eukaryotes. Simple cell life, such as bacteria and archaea, microbes, might actually be abundant throughout the universe, but complex life is now expected to be so rare from this finding that we are very likely alone in our galaxy and may also be alone in the universe even though there are an estimated two trillion galaxies in the known universe. Guy has recently received a number of patents for a light-bending material which can cause an object behind it to become invisible across numerous parts of the spectrum and even block thermal detection. Kramer asked the question, if these craft are so advanced, then why can't they make their craft invisible to us? I can already make ground targets and flying drones invisible with our patented light-bending material. It is only a matter of time before we make larger flying helicopters and aircraft invisible. You would think that aliens that can travel through the galaxy would be able to match and exceed our own technology, but these craft do not demonstrate this ability. On the contrary, they usually glow and can be picked up on visual and infrared optics and sensors. Why not imitate the lights on conventional aircraft. You still have a glowing hull or circles that could be red, green, blue, yellow, or other colors depending on the power output and atmospheric conditions. It would be difficult and unconvincing to try to look like a conventional aircraft with that glow. Guy further states, I believe that 99.9% .9 plus of the military is completely unaware that this technology exists or that it could even be from their government, and in most cases, the visual evidence was gathered when they accidentally flew into an area 
that these exotic craft did not expect any conventional military allied aircraft to be flying. It is bound to happen a few times every year. The unique flight characteristics and lack of an apparent propulsion system would confound all attempts for military pilots and or their leaders to explain what they are, which causes the public to assume they are more advanced than we have the capabilities for. Many of these newer sightings are likely unmanned and remotely piloted due to the high G maneuvers that are beyond what humans are capable of enduring. If aliens are visiting from other worlds, we should have easily picked up on their communications, but space is silent for those signals. We seem to be alone. The evidence shows complex life started just one time on Earth, and UAPs are not what many want or expect them to be. Are these IFOs or IAPs, ion flying objects or ion anomalous phenomenon, a threat to the public? Likely only if one accidentally crashed into you and they seem to operate away from populated areas to retain their secrecy. Whoever actually developed this complex technology did so in secret and it happens to have ionization as a byproduct of this propulsion system. This is not well understood outside of the inner circle of people that have full access to these programs. Through minimal disinformation, the public and most scientists assume there must be abundant life throughout the universe, and these are evidence of that, hence other world explanations. If people actually understood the vast distances between stars and the time it would take to travel between them by some advanced civilization, even at close to the speed of light and the factors that limit complex life, they may not be so inclined to believe in alien-operated craft. Kramer concludes, My issue is that so many people will view recent military-obtained evidence that has now been disclosed and believe we are being visited and or observed by aliens. That assumption can change your entire perspective on life. In this case, I am referring to complex life, which is much rarer than science anticipated.